the devil and he talks about how it's really important to talk to somebody about something useful after lunch. It's always important after a meal because then they're kind of zoning out and you've sort of got their attention. Okay, so we're talking about women, Muslim women in African literature and I wanted you to consider this point of view. Muslim women have been producing creative oral and literary works in sub-Saharan Africa since long before the colonial period, which was about 1900 to 1960, although their voices often have not been heard as widely as those of men, if at all. Often these works were produced in the context of family study groups, and that was especially true <coughs> for those who were more devout and more um, interested in uh, the philosophies that um, were the foundation, especially for Sufi studies. So the manuscripts of these kinds of women remain in their family libraries. Now, we were really lucky. You saw that big, thick book of Nana Asma'u's works. And it was just chance that allowed Jean Boyd to have access to those manuscripts. Um, imagine, if you can, the many, many, many hundreds of families in <coughs> North Africa, West Africa, East Africa, South Africa, everywhere where you find Islam on the continent, who have stacks and stacks of unbound, handwritten manuscripts in their family library. So when you click onto Amazon and you try to plug in a search phrase like Muslim women writers, you'll come up with some of the ones that I'm going to show you in the later part of this PowerPoint slideshow. But what you won't find is all the many, many, many manuscripts that remain in private family holdings that will likely disappear before they are translated into languages that the world beyond those families um, can know. So here is a rough vision of Islam in Africa. It's not a totally accurate map. And when I started putting this together, I started with populations, and I started doing demographics. Okay, how many Muslims in Mauritania out of the total population? How many in Nigeria? And I realized very quickly that it was kind of a useless exercise. You can go and do that if you want. Um, so for example, let's take Nigeria. You see that the northern half of Nigeria is kind of, you know, 120% Muslim. Um, and the southern part is not. It's a majority, a Christian majority. We heard yesterday and this morning about the situation in Sudan and the numbers of Muslims and non-Muslims in, in that region. So um, you know what they say, figures lie and liars figure. So when you see demographics, take it all with a grain of salt. It's useful. Um, but not always exactly accurate. And the other thing is that trying to get population numbers in Africa is very difficult, especially since the colonial period, because the British and the French and the Germans were trying to get a sense of numbers of people in each household so that they could charge tax. And so they didn't want to um, report all the members of the household because, of course, they didn't want to pay tax on everything. So uh, to this day, population numbers depend on self-reporting. And we used to 
say that in Nigeria we had uh, you know, maybe 150 million. I think now it's 175, 180 million. Um, the demographers in the 80s when I lived in Kano would say, oh, uh, maybe a population of 1 million, but the people I knew who worked there and lived there and had some sense of demographics said, no, easily 2 million, and by now more likely 5 million. Um, the point about Nigeria is that Nigeria's population is so significant for the whole continent of Africa that you can say that one in four Africans is a Nigerian. So what we're talking about with Islam in the northern half of Nigeria is that it is demographically representative of what you see um, for Africa in, in the entire region. Um, this says that the green areas are the Muslim areas. That is not to imply that there are no Muslims here and all the way up the coast, or that there are no Muslims in the Sahara where it's all kind of white. So that's where the majority, where the concentration of Muslims might be. But as my last lecture showed, there is, a, you know, that mosque I showed you from Cape Town was from one township in Cape Town, just one township. And the interesting thing about that mosque was that it was right across the street from the Sikh temple. So it was very ecumenical. Um, so this gives you a little bit of an idea of how Islam is spread around Africa, but there's a lot more than this. Oral creative works are barely known beyond the vicinity of their origins. And women everywhere produce written literature that might never be known outside their regions. In Africa, they write in local languages as well as Arabic. Prior to the mid 20th century, their works were handwritten manuscripts for use among family members and local students. And that is what the manuscripts that Nana Asmahu produced were like and what they were for. She would write in the language of the audience. Her family was ethnically Fulani, so they spoke full, full day. But when she was writing a poem that she wanted to use for teaching purposes among the Hausa majority, she would write in Hausa. She was quadrilingual, just by the way, fluent in Arabic, full, full day, Hausa, and Tamshek which fortunately for us she did not write in. It looks kind of like Klingon when, when you write it out. It's the language of the Tuareg Berbers um, who are in the Sahara, but also in the northern part of Nigeria as well. So she would write, and, and this reflects something that the Prophet Muhammad said, teach to the ability of your students. And those of you who are teachers in this group understand full well how important that is. You don't use mathematical language for students of history, and you don't use uh, convoluted language for people who aren't ready to understand that. And you certainly don't use a different language entirely if you want people to get your message. So that's one thing. When they're written, they're written in the language of the audience. But the other thing is, there is an oral language and there's a written language. And as I said in the last lecture, you can be very knowledgeable and very um, um, educated without necessarily being literate. And conversely, keep in mind, you can be very literate and be very stupid. I'm sure um, anybody knows an example of a very well-educated idiot. So, you know, education is never a, a necessary um, uh, mate of wisdom. So this oral language is suitable for teaching information to people who are not literate. You can't expect them to look at squiggles on a page and have them mean anything. This has... Um, then an issue when we've discussed literature. So what do we call things that are oral? Do we call them orature? Well, so 
Some scholars have done that and written studies about orature. Some scholars use the term oral literature, which is maybe kind of contradictory. But my point here, and all I want you to understand, is that when something is conveyed orally, it is as valid as a message as something that's written down. And not everything that's written down has value. Um, if you want a correlative in your own life, think of the song lyrics that you know. I mean, you don't learn these song lyrics by necessarily going to the screen and Googling them and figuring it. You learn them by listening to the songs. And any, of, any one of you could recite a song to me without ever having seen it written. There's your oral literature. There's your orature. So it's very much alive in your culture, too. You just don't realize it in the same way. So here is a question that I want you to consider in the course of learning something from this lecture. What is literature? What is orature? What about the printed language? What about the language itself? What about marketing and the audience? What role does a publisher have in choosing what should be actually printed and sold? Well, it depends on what they think they can market. They need a hook. It doesn't mean that everything that's published is good. And it doesn't mean that everything that's good gets published. So you're kind of stuck there. And as an audience, you need to be discriminating about what you're looking for. And you need not to assume that everything's out there. You need to go searching for it. If you get an idea of something you're looking for just because you don't find it in printed form, doesn't mean it's out there. Look harder. Look in other ways. Consider other forms of it. So let's talk about these issues with relation to women's roles, Muslim women's roles in the 21st century as writers, and maybe a little in the 20th century too, and maybe a little in the 19th century too. So here she is again, uh, an image of what we think Nana Asma'u bin Sheikh Osman al Fodio looked like. This means her name was Asma'u, her title was Nana, which was an honorific. Bint means daughter of, and she was the daughter of the Sheikh. This is another way to spell it. You saw it written on the board as H-A-Y-K-H, and this is the Hausa and Fulfulde way of writing it. And his name was Usman Dun, which is the Hausa form of Ibn, the Arabic Ibn, son of. So he was Usman, son of Fodio. This surname for the family Fodio means, it's a Fulfulde word, and it means learned. So the whole family were people who were scholars, who trusted, who believed in scholarship and the pursuit of knowledge. So this woman, Nana Asma'u, was an accomplished scholar, four languages, wrote poetry in three, depending on her audience, as I said earlier, for the purpose of educating people on what? Just the Quran? No. The information in the Quran, ethics, and practical matters related to daily life. Her Arabic works were distributed in and her reputation extended throughout the Maghreb, which is west, northwest Africa, as did the fame of her family members as scholars. When I was doing work in Rabat, Morocco, and in Fez, I'd go to archives and ask people. I, did, I didn't do very much archival work, mostly it was sitting in classes with women who were teaching Quranic chanting or hadith or things like that. But when I did go to the archives, I would ask if anybody had heard of the Fodios. And they said, of course we've heard of the Fodios. And this was all the way across the desert in Morocco. So um, we have evidence in her works in that big, thick book that I showed you this morning um, that she was known across the Maghreb because there's a letter in there from a man called Shinkiti, who, uh, that was a, a very common name, but he was a Moroccan who was writing a letter to her to praise her erudition and her scholarship. So we know that she was known, her works were known. She didn't travel to Morocco, but there was a lot of commerce across the Sahara, and her works went in that direction as well. So here's an example of what you saw earlier. 
Um, I didn't explain much about it this morning, but this is the very second poem that we know of that she wrote. The first was in 1820. And Fatinat is the term for the beginning of this poem, which takes its inspiration from a Quranic verse in chapter 94, verse 5. And the reason for this poem was that she was writing in response to a poem written by her brother, who was the leader, the commander of battle during a jihad battle. And he, the enemy's drums were um, audible right over the hill. It would be as if they were just outside the front door here in this building. And they could hear that he was going to ride off to battle, and he was very worried. And you know they were vastly outnumbered, and he was worried about whether he would survive. So he, who had been um, a lifelong uh, scholarly companion as well as sibling with Asma, wrote a poem to her and left it on her bed for her to find. And in haste, so that she could write this poem of response to him and get it to him before he actually left for the battle, she just dashed off this poem very quickly which is amazing and is indicative of her scholarly capability because not only does it respond to his poem, but it responds to it by saying, listen, don't you worry, because this is what it says in the Quran in 94.5. And it is also indicative of her capability because it is written in a form that puts the first letter of every word in the first line of that verse 594. At the beginning of the first line, we're reading right to left, so that you can read the first letter <coughs> of each line vertically. And when you do that, then you get kind of an acrostic that says, and the rest of that first line. And the way that translates is, so verily, with every difficulty, there is ease. And this was her way of quoting something in the Quran that would give him confidence to go out there and face the enemy and know that all he could do was do his best and, and leave the rest up to God. So this very complicated poetic form, she had mastered and was able to write this cogently, quickly, in response to his writing. So many of her poems were published in that book we showed you. And we were lucky to have copies that we could take pictures of that were in good form. However, what I found in the archives in Rabat was that many of the things they brought to me were in this shape. And I know from what I have seen in Sopoto, in the History Bureau, and I can only imagine what it's like in the family library holdings, that maybe we have a similar situation. Jean Boyd and I know that there are many more poems of Asma'u's sisters, Mariam, Hafsatu, um, Halima, that are in the holdings, either in the History Bureau or in the family home. And they, I have seen them in the History Bureau being eaten by bugs and destroyed by the climate, the heat, the dust. And so they will disappear. They will just disappear. So the book that I'm writing now has a few poems by some of these other sisters. and. I'll include those and talk about those. But given the conditions in northern Nigeria right now, and given the sense that people are very territorial about their families' manuscripts, as they rightly should be, because too often during the colonial period, people would come along and say, oh, let me see those. I'll bring them back. And of course, they disappear forever. Uh, or researchers who are not responsible do the same thing. So you understand that people don't want to give away their family treasures, because their family treasures are intellectual treasures, not, not gold, not 
silver, not gemstones, but the writings. So that means that there's a lot out there by a lot of women, as well as a lot of men, that will disappear forever, and no one will ever know that it existed. It doesn't mean that no one wrote it. OK, so this book uh, is a Kalamiya Hanumata, Pen in the Hands of Women. And this was one that I put together for Gaskia Tati Kwabo, which is a Hausa publishing company in northern Nigeria. And the reason I did that was that after my initial um, uh, forays into my research on House of Poetry, when a man on the university campus said to me, oh, women don't write poetry, and I'm like, oh, good, you know, I'm here for two years, and what am I going to do? Um, I found out that he was wrong. You saw pictures of Hawa Goran and Yashehu in the last lecture. They were the principal poets who wrote things, and then the way they delivered them was to deliver them orally on the radio so they could be broadcast to women who were pounding grain and were not literate, but they could listen and they could hear these things. Um, these poets were in poetry circles where they competed to see who could win the prize for the best poetry. So I, I went, you know, I worked with these women for a while. I had stacks of their poems. And I went to the editor at Gaskia and Tafi Cuoco and I said, you know, you've got all these chapbooks. They call, they call little books like this chapbooks. And they had hundreds of them by men. And they used them in secondary schools. Lots and lots of them. This is what Gaskia Tafi Cuoco Publishing Company produced. And, and I said to him, you know, you really ought to do a book like this by women. And he said, oh, there aren't any poems by women. And I said, oh, excuse me. I said, here they are. And I picked up the whole stack of papers and showed him. And the poor man had no choice. He had to produce this. So when I showed this to Hawa Guaram, she said, oh, they put my picture on the cover. She was so thrilled. Um, the reason this was important was that at least for the run of the, the, the lot until they sold out, they used these in secondary schools. And so children in the school and young adults in the school could have a book representing the poetry that these two women wrote. Um, both these women were daughters of rural imams, religious leaders. Uh, they learned to read and write in the context of their religious education. They had never seen Asma'u's works because those works were not published until nearly 20 years later. But they knew of her. She was a legend in her own time and beyond. And they considered her to be their role model in terms of guaranteeing their freedom to be educated and write expressive works. I said to one of these women at one point, um, how is it that your husband allows you to do this writing? And I got, wait for it. I can't. Can you, can you do a real good teeth sucking kind of sound? Yeah? yeah, that's what I always got for an answer, which was a polite way of saying dumb question. Then she looked at me and she said, no, no, I'm not going to do the condition. And I said, second dumb question, wait for it, who did Nana Asmahu? And then I got a really, go to Sokoto, she said. Find Jean Boyd, she knows Nana Asmahu. I had no clue. Which tells you that Nana Asmahu, daughter of jihad leader, is nowhere. In all the books I had written, in, uh, written, read in graduate school in preparation for my field work. Nothing had been written about her. So I went to Sokoto, and I found this British woman, Jean Boyd. I said, excuse me, I'm an American researcher. I'm sorry to bother you. Yeah, this foolish woman. Um, I'm looking for Nana Asmahu. And she said to me, oh, I'm so sorry. You are 150 years too late. She has died, but do come in and have some tea. So I went in and had tea. And she told me about how she was working on these poems. And I said, well, 
Oh, where are they? You know, fresh from my field methods course. You know, you always make copies, you always send a copy home. If there's a fire, what are you going to do if you lose your material? I said, so, so where are these poems? She said, oh, pull out that box from under the couch. I said, oh, well, these surely are not the only copies that you have. Now, mind you, she did not have the originals. They were in the family archive. She had pictures of them. She said, oh, yeah, that's all I've got. I've been looking at them, thinking what to do with them. And I said, well, aren't you worried about what's going to happen? She said, no, 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 no. Well, there was a fire last year. <laughs> Losing my mind. So Jean and I have been, I've been badgering her since 1980 uh, when, when I first came to know of this. And the reason was that I did not publish my dissertation on contemporary House of Women poets and performers unless I had a context. And here was the historical context, so it was really important. So a smile was important, but these kinds of things become ephemera. They disappear, they don't get reprinted, they're gone. Generation later, you don't even know they existed. Oops. So here's Hawa Gwaram, whom we met earlier. She's the one who said, oh, they put my picture on the cover. And here is Yavshehu, whose work you already heard about in the previous lecture. And so their work is in that book. And then after I had published the big fifth book of con co um, translations, the collected works translations, for the 19th century, then I could safely publish what I had found for the 20th <coughs> century. And in this book um, that Indiana U University Press published, um, what we did for the original versions that were audio taped was we put them in MP3 format. It was that, you know, technology has changed that much, that rapidly. So um, all the hours of performance would have taken multiple CDs, but they compressed them into MP3 format and put that at the back because the press did not want to spend the pages publishing the house of that I had so painstakingly written out. Um, but that's all right, at least it was there. And this one volume showcases traditional literary art forms in the region. Now this is just one example, just one example. And there are many others um, that you may or may not hear about. There are some others published in American publishing houses, but there are many others that will be in the form of ephemera and many others that remain on the shelf in people's libraries and will not get published. So let's move to things that you can find on Amazon. <coughs> the best known math marketed 20th and 21st century Muslim African women writers include authors of both fiction and nonfiction from all over the continent. Um, the best known ones are Mariam Maba in Senegal, Aisa Jabbar in Algeria, Fatima Mernisi, and Leila Abu Said from Morocco, and Nawal El Sadawi and Leila Ahmed from Egypt. So let's look at these women. Mariam Maba, 1929 to 1981, was a Senegalese author and feminist who wrote in French. And her book, So Long a Letter, I call it So Long a Letter, So Short a Book. It's a very short book, very useful for your classes. And then Scarlet Song. She was born in Dakar. She was raised a Muslim. But at an early age, came to criticize what she perceived as inequalities between the sexes, resulting from traditional views. Raised by her traditional grandparents, she struggled to gain an education. She later married a member of parliament, but divorced him and was left to care for their nine children. Her frustration with the fate of African women and her ultimate acceptance of it is fo the focus of so long a letter. And in it, she depicts the sorrow and resignation of a woman who must share the mourning for her late husband with his second younger wife, who gets all his inheritance. Ba uh, died a year after protracted illness before the publication of her second novel, 
which describes the hardships a woman faces when her husband abandons her for a young, uh, younger woman he knew as a youth. And I put wiki here because some of this stuff is available on Wikipedia and you can easily find it, not my original words. The book, So Long a Letter, uh, which I did not bring, um, but it's about, it's about this big. And it really is written in a letter form. Dear Ramatulay, let me tell you about what is going on. And it really is heart-wrenching. Um, and if you know anything about Islam, you can talk about this, this whole situation and the focus of this fictional account very closely based on her own personal account as the um, The, the difference between Islam and tradition, the ways in which tradition and patriarchy overcome the um, benefits that are supposed to be guaranteed for women in Islam. Um, her source of determination and commitment to the feminist cause came from her background. She is among the first to have illustrated the disadvantaged position of women in African society. She focuses on the grandmother, the mother, the sister, the daughter, the cousin, and the friend, and how they all deserve the title Mother of Africa, and how important they are for society. And this is from the Africa Books Collective. Um, it's a very sad story, and she points out in the course of it um, specific aspects of Islam that are transgressed by the actions of her husband. Aisa Jabbar, the pen name of Fatima Zora, a Malayan, was an Alger is an Algerian novelist, translator, and filmmaker. She's currently at NYU. In 96, she won the prestigious uh, Nistat International Prize for Literature and also the Yorsenor Prize, and then the Peace Prize of the German Book Trade, and has been elected to the Académie Française, which is mostly a men's club, so this is quite a coup for her. In 85, she published uh, Fantasia, an Algerian cavalcade, where she repeatedly states her ambivalence about language, about her identification as a Western-educated Algerian feminist Muslim intellectual about her role as a spokesperson for Algerian women as well as for women in general. And in among her works are these, where they have been translated to English. You see the translations listed. Algerian Cavalcade, Sister to Shahrazad, and Women of Algiers in Their Apartment comprise a trilogy that are related. The middle one is one that I've used a lot in African literature courses. The form of it is a braided novel. Um, so you have a chapter from one point of view, a chapter from another point of view, and then it goes back and forth between those points of view. And it, unless your students understand this sort of DNA um, pattern, then they'll be confused. Um, but once you explain it to them, it's fairly clear. And she is absolutely frank in this story about <laughs> abuses of women, like um, the abuse of the grandfather against the granddaughter, or the brother against the sister. Uh, sexual abuse and um, the extent to which families will even acknowledge it, much less deal with it. She talks a great deal about Islam and what is offered but not delivered because of society's perspectives. Um, this Moroccan woman certainly doesn't look oppressed or submissive <coughs> Fatima Mernisi is a sociologist, a feminist, a writer. These are her books. These are women who have successfully plugged into marketing and have been able to make their material available. 
Fatima Renisi is one of a trilogy of women who had been important, who have been important since the mid 70s in terms of talking about women's roles in Islam for the world in general. In 1975, she published Beyond the Veil. And that was quite an extra extraordinary book that talked about um, this whole issue of what Islam promises as opposed to what patriarchy delivers. The other two in the trilogy we're going to talk about in a moment, Nawal El Sadawi and Leila Ahmed, um, both Egyptians. You can see among her works, fiction, nonfiction, she is, um, this, this book, The Harem Within, Dreams of Trespass, that is her memoir. It's a wonderful book that I use in a course on Muslim women's autobiography. It's very important to hear women's own voices about their lives. Um, another book that is uh, very controversial is The Veil and the Male Elite, 1987 in French, 1992 in English translation. In that, she does things like, for example, she challenges the validity of certain hadiths that are considered traditional and credible hadiths. One in particular says, any woman who, any country that is led by a woman is doomed to fail. Now, a hadith is a reported saying by the prophet or about the prophet, and its credibility is judged by the veracity of the chain of transmission from the original speech of the prophet Muhammad to the one who reported it. Um, what she does in this book is to challenge the credibility of that speaker because she says, we know that he lied about this other thing in history. And so if he has lied there, he cannot be a credible link in the chain of transmission. It's exactly what an attorney would do in this country, saying that witness is not credible, so you have to discount it. And she says, why is it that the wife of the prophet Muhammad, Aisha, who is said to have transmitted 2,000 hadiths, sayings by the prophet Muhammad, of those 2,000, why is it that only six are included in the accepted, complete hadiths <coughs> as they stand now. There was no chain of transmission. It was Aisha who heard it directly from her husband. Why are they not all included? So this is her point of view. And there had been, there continues to be a lot of pushback against the audacity that she had to criticize. In fact, some people have said, some of my students have said, how dare she? criticize them. This is not good scholarship. It's unseemly that she criticizes them. But she says, as other scholars do, other feminist scholars, it is my obligation to speak about truth. And no one should tell me that I cannot seek truth in this way. So here are her books. Beyond the Veil, Veil of the Male Elite, Doing Daily Battle, Dreams of Trespass, Shahrazad Goes West, The Herald of Thin. Oops. Oh, yeah. Another Moroccan, Leila Abu Said, born in 1950 is a Moroccan author. She writes in Arabic. This is significant because Morocco was a French colony. She purposely, from the time she was young, said she would not use French because it was not her language. It was not her country's language. She was not going to use French. She had radio broadcasts in her younger days and uh, did things like translated autobiography of Malcolm X into Arabic and read it on the radio, and then started writing her own books. The Year of the Elephant is fiction, a Moroccan woman's journey toward independence. Return to Childhood is an autobiography. The Last Chapter and The Director are other pieces of fiction. And she is adamant about using only Arabic and talking about what women put up with in traditional society. 
Now, while El Sadawi, as I mentioned last time, um, there should not be an S on Egyptian. An Egyptian surgeon, activist, author of 10 nonfiction works, six memoirs, 11 novels, eight short stories, three plays, and she's still going strong. She's still writing. She's very old. You can see she was at KU uh, a couple years ago. You can see those white pigtails. When my hair gets really white, I'm going to you know, wear pigtails too. She, she talked about that will be on the quiz, don't worry. She, um, she talked, she gave a talk about creativity and anarchy, which I thought was kind of an odd combination until I heard her delivery. And her rationale was that you cannot be creative without expressing pushback against the status quo. So creativity is always anarchy. And if you are not being creative and pushing back against the status quo, then you're not doing your job. She's absolutely radical in her 80s. We should all be half as creative and radical. She's had her passport revoked. She's had death threats. And she's one who has taught at Duke. And uh, this, her second husband, is her translator for much of her her work. She experienced clitoridectomy at the age of five. Her work, The Hidden Face of Eve, is the story of, of that. Um, and it is a devastating work that's absolutely accessible to undergraduates. She was pulled out of her sleepy bed at age five and hauled off somewhere to have her genitals excised without anesthesia and without explanation. And she was terrified. Nevertheless, she um, went through school even when her brother, who had failing grades, was given more advantage at school than she was. She was an A student because she was defiant. And she went through medical school. She became a surgeon. She wrote fiction. She did all these things because there was such anger and activism in her she had to express it somehow, and this is what she did. So here are some of her books. Here are some more of her books, and some more of her books. She just keeps churning them out and plays. And there's a memoir. Uh, so, so together with Fatima Marinisi's Beyond the Veil, we also have Noel El Sadawi's Face of Youth. That's the second of the, the three that came along in the 70s and 80s. Now, um, Dr. Leila Ahmed is of this group. She also is Egyptian. She's now at Harvard Divinity School. So she was um, someone who was there when, when I was there for the um, Sultan of Sokoto's speech. And, and it was really. Um, wonderful to have a chance to talk with her. Women and Gender in Islam is a very important book um, that traces the history of the development of the introduction to and development of Islam in Egypt. And her story of border passage from Cairo to America is her autobiography. And A Quiet Revolution is her most recent publication talking about the new trend toward veiling in recent years as an outward sign, a defiant outward sign of Muslim women's assertion of their Islamic identity. And so what she has seen <coughs> when she has lived here in the United States is that more and more and more women are beginning to veil. She obviously does not veil. Now, while El Sadawi does not fail, Fatima Marnisi does not fail. And this woman did not fail. Fatima Rifat was better known by her pen name, Alifa Rifat, an Egyptian, another Egyptian woman, whose controversial short stories are renowned for their depictions of the dynamics of female sexuality, relationships, and loss. Um, they remain religiously faithful in the face of all these difficulties, her, her characters do. And she is, um, her, it says at the bottom she used a pen name. And the reason was that 
she is very frank in her story, in her discussions. For instance, the very first story is, is the, um, traces the thoughts of a woman as her husband is having sex with her, and she's like thinking about something else and not really engaged. And she hears the call to prayer, and then she, he gets done, so she goes and washes, and she comes back and realizes he's dead. And you go, I can't believe I'm reading this. And she doesn't really care because he really has not been on her side. And, you know, and then she talks about the whole issue and, and how women are not valued and co-wives and, and how men interpret Islam. So she's very frank about sexuality. There's another story about um, a kind of weird relationship that we don't know. Um, we don't know whether it's true or not, or whether the woman's dreaming. They move to a new house on the Nile, and there's a snake, and it's all about orgasm and what the snake, the female genie in the snake, taught her about orgasm. And you're going, really? This this polite conservative Muslim woman in Egypt wrote these stories. They're kind of like they're not pornographic, but they're they're a little more frank than we're used to. Um, but she is very frank. And she is very thoughtful about her description of what is allowed of women, expected of women, denied to women. Now, here's another example. Now, so all those women you can find on Amazon. But then we have another whole wave of women. For instance, one example is of a prolific Muslim African woman writer about whom you have never heard, probably, right? Safinis Kazin. Yeah, no, she doesn't call herself Safinis Kazim, Safinis Kazim. It's a typo. She should only be there one time. A journalist, although she would say, yes, put my name there twice. I'm that good. You should put it there twice. She's a journalist, theater critic, and writer, author of many books in the 60s. She was a graduate student in the United States, in Kansas, in Chicago, in New York. She went to NYU to get her master's degree. She's the ex-wife of the Egyptian poet Ahmed Fouad Nigam and the mother of the political activist and writer Nawawa, Nawara Nagam. And we'll hear more about her in a minute, and just as we get to the end of this. She is one of the subjects in this wonderful film called, write it down, Four Women of <coughs> Egypt. Four Women of Egypt. Write it down. Look for it on YouTube. It's in four parts. I show it to my classes. I'm so glad it's on YouTube now. These four women have been friends since they were children. Two of them are Muslim, one veils, one doesn't. One is a Christian, one is an atheist. They're all Egyptian activist women. women. Um, the atheist is a university professor. The Christian is a journalist, has been a journalist. The woman who does not veil was the wife of the activist who uh, died in the effort to help peasants get their land back. And the fourth one is this woman who, um, you should see the other pictures of her, you know, backpacking across Europe, baseball cap. She was at NYU in Washington Square in the 60s when women were burning bras and being very activists. So she's led quite a life. This poet um, was her second husband. He, she shocked people by marrying him. He was known to like go out in his pajamas pretty often, which I know y'all do now once in a while. Uh, but, you know, back then, it was not something that people did. And then she divorced him and uh, moved to Iraq, where she taught at the university and married someone there and divorced him. Um, she um, is a literary critic. She got a BA from Cairo University, uh, worked on a newspaper, and then wrote for magazines and a publishing house. She currently writes for various newspapers and articles, and has been known to walk off the set of talk shows. Excuse me, you can't leave, we're on the air. She says, I don't care if we're on Saturn. She was fed up with somebody, what, what somebody said to her. She just left, she didn't care. Um, Okay, these, this is the, the film I told you to write down. It's on YouTube, Four Women in Egypt. 
Canadian company did it. The four friends are Widad, Safinez, Shahinda, and Amina. And they fight like cats and dogs with each other on the screen, and they love each other absolutely to death. It's very interesting to watch this film because one will ask a question in Arabic, the other one will answer in French. Or, for instance, the university professor who teaches French literature will take Safinez's plays and translate them. And in one scene, she's they're sitting down to tea. And the university professor says to Safinez, would you like me to, to, to read my translation to you? And so she's reading it. And Safinez is listening. And she goes, yeah, it even sounds fantastic, even in French. So she's very confident about what she writes. And they speak to each other in different languages. They're all fluent in Arabic, French, and English. Um, they've traveled a lot. And they were all in jail together. They were jailed by Nasser. Then they were jailed by Sadat. And Nawal El Sadawi joined them in jail. So she's part of the group as well. Um, they tell the story about how um, Amina would always say, oh, cover up, a man is coming. Um, and then one time, uh, and, and so the women would scream when somebody was going, oh, whoo, and, and they would cover up. And one time somebody screamed, and it was a cockroach, and they said, you know, what is the problem? Oh, just a cockroach. So the next time somebody screamed, they said, wait, is it a man or is it a cockroach? And of course, the answer was, well, you know, what's the difference? <laughs> Here she is. She has bailed since she went on Hodge, but she never bailed before then. She's anti nasserist anti-Sadatist, anti mubarakist anti-Saddamist. She left Iraq when Saddam began to be um, nasty, nastiest. And she's um, a devoted feminist and nationalist. Now, this page, and, and we're just about at the end. This is sort of the last thing that I want to show you. This is a page about her daughter. So this woman is the daughter of, there she is. That's the woman you're thinking of. Um, born in Cairo, she's the daughter of Safinis Kazim and her poet husband. It's the only child Safinis has. She's now 40. She's a blogger and human rights activist. She's, um, she has earned her BA in English language from the Faculty of Arts in Ain Shams University. That's like if you got your BA in Arabic here, right? And has worked for the Egyptian Nile Television Network as a translator and news editor. She published her first book, A Nest on the Wind, a collection of articles. She co-authored a book written by women writers under the title of I'm Female. Her journalistic career um, involves a variety of endeavors. And as you see in this first paragraph, the then editor-in-chief of the magazine she worked for decided to hire her. Um, she worked as an apprentice. And the ex-CEO of that organization said, no, you can't hire her saying she will be tenured or hired when she ceases to be the daughter of Safinez Khazim and Ahmed Fouadi. So uh, she was a little too radical for his taste. She has worked for other um, newspapers and television networks. She writes a weekly column and a blog. Freedom is only for those who are ready to die, it says. She was there at Tahrir Square in Cairo and volunteered as a spokesperson of the revolution, reporting to the media, mainly Al Jazeera TV, about her observations. Now, here's a recent, you see it's January 18th, blog. Um, 
And here is the short blog. I don't see a single faction not covered with shit, even those who pretend they're revolutionaries and people with principles, but of course not, because they're agents and spies, but because they're confused. And when a person is this confused, he needs to retire, just as I have decided to retire. And this scene is really confusing. So as they say, the apple does not fall far from the tree. So we come to the last slide that I have, and I ask you for the prompt to consider what you've seen. To consider, what do we call literature? It is communication. But who decides? How is it defined? What does this mean for women's creative productivity? How are women's social roles relevant to how we understand and define literature? Is literature printed or spoken, published or written? Is it religious, political, aesthetic, informative, fiction, nonfiction, prose, poetry, plays, song lyrics, radio broadcasts, blogs, Twitter? You decide. And when you say, no, Muslim women don't produce literature, you need to consider all these things. Consider the manuscripts and family holdings that are rotting, being eaten by insects. Consider who decides what gets put on air. Who decides what gets put on paper? Who decides what will make money for them? Or what, does, what makes money? Things that support <coughs> the stereotypes that we hold. That's what makes money. Because that's what people will buy. So how do we know that what we hear is all there is to hear? We have to assume there's more. OK, so what questions do you have for me? Oh, by the way, this is Distant View of a Minaret, those short stories that are so shocking by Alifa Rufai. Here's another example of stories by Egyptian women collected by Marilyn Booth. All Muslim women you've never heard of, but they're out there. Questions? Question. 